we do have them out okay, here. Um, do we want to hear from them and then re redo this? Is that fine, group? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Chair Anderson, I turn it over to you. Good afternoon, um, governors. Um, it's good to be here, and I'm sorry if you were waiting for us. Um, I must have missed our cue because I have been listening in for the majority of the afternoon. Um, but here we are, and I see that um, Professor Hugh Spitzer has just joined us as well. Hello. And I'm really here primarily to introduce um, Professor Spitzer. Um, he chaired the subcommittee of the Committee on Professional Ethics that dealt with the um, Attorney General's Office request for a proposed amendment to the RPCs, which would ensure that attorneys who advise clients about reproductive rights would not be um, subject to discipline by the Washington um, State Bar Association. Um, the Attorney General's request was prompted, as I'm sure you can imagine, by the um, U.S. Supreme Court's overturning of the Roe v. Wade decision and the plethora of state um, um, legislative action that has resulted from that. But with that introduction, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Spitzer for a brief summary of our recommendation, and then we will be happy to answer questions that the board may have. Thank you. So this is Hugh Spitzer, and I, as Pam said, I chaired the subcommittee of the Committee on Professional Ethics that uh, looked at a request that you sent us uh, last August the request that came from uh, First Assistant Attorney General Kristen Bonesky, and she asked the, uh, the, the WBS, WSBA uh, either make a statement, uh, just some kind of statement on the issue of reproductive rights and, uh, and lawyers uh, and the RPCs, or to direct the, our committee on professional ethics to consider either issuing an advisory opinion or recommend either a, a rule change or new comments to RPC 1.2 and RPC 8.4. Um, uh, the, the, the basic scenario here, as outlined in the memo that we sent to you, it involves a lawyer Washington lawyer giving advice uh, on Washington law, but being treated by a prosecutor in another jurisdiction as uh, having engaged in possible criminal activity. An example would be advising a healthcare provider or a parent or a minor child or a victim of sexual uh, abuse, uh, uh, a person uh, who is uh, either a a doctor practicing in Idaho or a resident of Idaho asking about Washington law concerning uh, an abortion or other reproductive rights uh, in Washington state. And in that scenario, uh, a prosecutor or some opposing party or a family member, um, uh, among other things, might file uh, one or more disciplinary grievances against the Washington lawyer not to speak of potential criminal charges. Uh, the potential criminal charges for uh, assisting people in another state has been addressed by the legislature this past uh, session uh, and uh, through, through a bill that, uh, uh, that the legislature uh, adopted uh, ESHP Yes, HB 1469. I won't go into that. Our memo discusses that. But it doesn't cover situations where somebody might file a complaint with the Bar Association. Um, the Committee on Professional Ethics discussed this quite a bit. And I must say, we were initially somewhat skeptical about whether it made sense to uh, either tinker with the RPCs or to add 
a comment, sort of like the special comment that was adopted relating to lawyers giving advice on marijuana laws in Washington, notwithstanding uh, the fact that uh, uh, they were assisting somebody who might be violating federal law, although they're acting uh, uh, consistently with state law. And so um, we talked about it quite a bit and, uh, and, and reviewed the information on what was going on. And, uh, you know, it basically we concluded that private citizens and attorneys general and prosecutors in some jurisdictions around the country are, are already acting quite zealously to enforce uh, statutes that criminalize access to reproductive health services. And Washington lawyers thus would have a credible concern that law enforcement outside of Washington would investigate conduct associated with advice given by Washington attorneys on Washington reproductive rights laws. So we are recommending, after a great deal of discussion and, and tweaking of the language, that um, that the uh, BOG, uh, the, the Board of Governors, recommend to the Supreme Court um, a new special uh, comment to RPC 1.2D. And that's the provision that says that a lawyer shall not counsel a client to or assist the client uh, in engaging in activity that the lawyer knows is, is uh, criminal conduct. Uh, 8.4, of course, says that it's a, a professional misconduct to commit a criminal act. But we're talking about something that involves perhaps giving advice to a client in Idaho that Idaho views as being a criminal act, but, um, of course, is not a criminal act in Washington. So the specific language that we are recommending is um, on the uh, in the memo uh, toward the end, and we're suggesting that there be a uh, an additional uh, comment to 1.2 special circumstances involving advice and assistance about reproductive rights, and it would say a lawyer may counsel a client regarding Washington's laws related to reproductive health care services and may assist the client in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by those laws. And then it says that if a lawyer counsels or assists a client regarding Washington's laws related to reproductive health care services, that conduct and the predominant effect of the conduct shall be de deemed to occur in Washington for purposes of these rules. That's essentially a choice of law provision that hooks in RPC 8.5 about choice of law. Basically, we're saying for our discipline purposes, we're treating Washington lawyers giving advice on Washington law as happening in this state. And so for purposes of uh, attorney conduct, it's in this state under our laws and our RPCs. And then we're suggesting also an additional comment to 8.4, a lawyer who counsels a client regarding Washington laws relating to reproductive health care services or assists a client in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by those laws does not thereby violate RPC 8.4. So that's our proposal. And we'd be very pleased to answer any questions either about the specifics of the proposal or background uh, questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I should say the hand up by, um, yeah, okay, by um, 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 Brett, please. Thank you, Mr. President. So my question is, why are we limiting to just reproductive rights. I mean, right now I am sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for the, the Supreme Court to rule on 303 creative. There have been countless states that have gone after LGBTQ matters, including um, medical treatment for trans children. And in its current form, I can't support it, but I would love to support one that just says that 
blanket any lawful activity in Washington. I mean, I, I don't know why why the attorney general um, is asking for just reproductive rights when there are so many issues that are being put into this culture war around the country, including with our neighbors next door in Idaho, that it, it really just seems like it's being cherry picked for other reasons. And, and you know, I, I would love to say, I, I, because I agree with everything that was said. I just think that it's too narrow of a focus and we shouldn't be coming back one at a time just because the Supreme Court does something. Because literally Monday morning, we could be back here with the ruling that a website designer does not need to work with LGBTQ people. I mean, and who knows how far that decision is going to go. So right. is there a reason why it was just limited and not to yes. protect all lawyers doing lawful activities in Washington? Yes. Uh uh, we in one of our drafts we actually covered uh, gender affirming treatment because HB fourteen sixty nine that's the bill that the legislature passed and the governor signed uh, this year included in protected uh, uh, healthcare services. Um, not only reproductive health care services, but also gender affirming treatment. However, uh, the uh, uh, we we were advised, and I think it's you know, and I understand why um, that because we'd only been asked by the board of governors to address reproductive health care services that uh, it wasn't in our charge to recommend more than the topics that you originally asked us about. I can't speak for the attorney general's office, but my hunch is that when they wrote the original letter, the, there was great focus on reproductive rights and the trans uh, and uh, transgender issue and gender affirming issue simply this is just last August, but it hadn't hit the headlines, and we didn't have all these statutes being passed in other states about that. So that's an explanation of why, and if the board thinks that that this type of rule should be broader, of course, that's something we'd be happy to help out on. Thank you. Um, okay, I see next uh, by... Um, 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 Okay, yes. Um, um, Kevin, please. Uh, thank you, uh, President Clark, and, and thank you, Professor Spitzer. Um, I am going to second the emotion of my colleague, uh, Governor Williams Ruth, that uh, our colleagues in the state of Oregon have made a proposal to change the rule that you helpfully put into your memorandum. And I think that would be much more appropriate, a much more appropriate approach, because the laundry list is going to get a lot longer fairly quickly. And as they, I have a transgender daughter, now she's 22, but you know the idea that they're criminalizing medical procedures, it, I just find anathema. Um, the difficulty is none of us has a functional crystal ball. You know, it may be illegal in Florida to sell books with pictures in them. I don't know. But if it's legal here, we ought to be able to tell people, hey, it's legal here. Yeah. Um, if I can respond to that, um, we just recently became aware of the, uh, the recommendation in Oregon, uh, which is a, a change to the RPC to 1.2D itself, rather than just a comment. And, and that is a larger deal um, as a uh, kind of both a policy and a practical matter. We thought it was more appropriate uh, that we deal with this issue in comments and that 1.2 as currently written, actually provides quite a lot of protection to Washington lawyers 
giving advice uh, to clients uh, uh, about the state of the law. They're permitted to do that. In fact, some people, you know, originally thought, well, maybe we don't need to do anything at all. Uh, but uh, just about everybody on our committee changed our minds. But, um, you know, 1.2D says a lawyer, uh, although a lawyer can't counsel a client to commit a crime, a lawyer can discuss the legal consequences of a proposed course of conduct. Um, but uh, it it might be one thing to to expand the scope of this to include uh, uh, gender affirming care that would be, track what's in state law, what the legislature just adopted, um, to actually go in and uh, change the RPC would would give us an RPC that is different from the model rules. Nothing wrong with that, but that's a big step. And I've looked at the Oregon proposal, and I'm not convinced that, that it really works a whole heck of a lot better than what we have right now. So if you were to ask us to go back and both look at gender affirming care and also to look at the question of whether we should do something along the lines of what has been done in Oregon, definitely we'd be pleased to do that. Um, and we come back with another recommendation. Uh, a follow on question, uh, Professor. Would it be possible to craft the comment? To state that it's any any activity, healthcare, otherwise that is legal, and make the language broader so we won't have to bother you again in a year. Yeah, and and maybe it would be possible to do that where we give examples such as reproductive rights and um, gender affirming care. Again, those are the language that's in the state law this year but use them as an example for things that are lawful in Washington. I advise that would be Washington excellent. law. I, I th there's probably a way that we can thoughtfully do that. Okay, um, I, I, I do see Brent's hands up. Um, from a, a procedural matter, I, I didn't take you as making a motion, but a, a comment, so um, yeah. And that's what I was going to do. Okay. <laughs> um, well, and first I wanted to ask just the question um, because I, I'm i looking at the proposed language and of course I'm flipping between screens and I'm having issues. So the current the proposal that I'm wondering is if we just added the comment under paragraph D, uh, this is a comment to RPC 1.2. I'm currently looking at page 326 of the PDF of our materials says under paragraph D, a lawyer may counsel a client regarding Washington laws and may assist a client that um, in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by those laws. If a lawyer counsels or assists a client regarding Washington's laws, that conduct and the predominant effect of the conduct shall be deemed to occur. I, I guess I don't understand why we need to have specific language relating to reproductive health or gender affirming care because again i i'm happy to say that any valid law in washington should be protected by if an attorney is giving that counsel or advice so mm -hmm. I, I i i use the issue of reproductive of gender affirming care as the liaison to q law and our lgbt section and these were comments they brought to me before today's meeting but i'm thinking just broadly of if if a lawyer in Washington is you know again as as Governor Faye said we have no idea what our our forty nine other states are going to be passing for rules and regulations that will become prohibited conduct I mean we've got book burnings we're we're I mean heck in the state of Florida they have completely defunded all DEI in their state universities I mean do we need to then say if somebody is in you know is counseling people on DEI measures. So I, I, that's why I'm wondering, Mr. Spitzer, Professor Spitzer, if, if, if we can just say regarding Washington's laws and leave the rest out. You, you can do that. Um, 
Uh, I, I mean, I can't speak for the AG's office, but I, I guess I can speak for the people on our subcommittee. We would be worried that without at least calling out reproductive rights, and if you wanted to gender affirming care, um, that it would not provide the, as much protection in terms of preventing a chilling effect uh, of, let's say, a threatening AG or prosecutor in Idaho, that it might work better to use your language, but still give examples. So for example, and I think it would make more sense for this to go back to our committee to really think it through because, I mean, we've, we really scrubbed this, we're making a recommendation. And I think it's important if the board wants to change course, that we be able to go back and consider that carefully and come back with a thoughtful recommendation. So it might be okay, but I would want to really scrub it. Hey, Brent, are you good right now? No, okay. No okay. But, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh. So at least right now. So I see a Alec next and then um, a Nam. No, I lower my hand. Okay. Sorry, Nam. Um, if I read correctly the risk analysis, um, General Counsel, I think you were, did I misunderstand that you, you weren't sure this should come up and be voted on today? But in any case, and if you did or didn't, I think the conversation is such that Professor Spitzer, if you were... Uh, willing to go back and do some more work as we've discussed, um, then as opposed to trying to um, resolve or draft anything on the fly here by the Board of Governors, then that would be the course that we, we should take and request that you come back with uh, some refinements and, and maybe um, Governors William Williams, Ruth and Fay, uh, as well as General Counsel can um, at least stand by to work with you on what that new proposal would, would look like, um, maybe coming back in our August session. By uh, Rick next, online. The concern I have is if you put, um, if you put uh, an example, just the one example of reproductive rights in there, can that be read as excluding other rights? In other words, if you're going to include that, I would include more than one and then say, you know, including but not limited to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have people interpreting it to exclude those things that are not mentioned. I think that's a, yeah, that's a thoughtful suggestion. I see the hand raised by uh, Pam online. I'll get you next with you. Um, I'll be happy to defer to the other questions by the governors. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Pam. Uh, okay, let's go next to um um okay to um uh, okay to um Nancy next and 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 then uh, um yes. Uh, I think maybe yeah. Francis is here. Is here. Yeah. All right, I'm just gonna go. Um I <laughs> I um, fully agree with what my fellow governors are saying regarding the breadth of this um, comment. And I'm supportive of providing um, an example to produce the chilling effect that I think I think is a very wise thought on that. Um, to that extent, though, I would prefer that the example not only include reproductive rights, but um, gender affirming care if possible, because I do think that at least right now, what we understand is those are the two um, controversial um, concepts that are coming up right now. And so my preference would be to make it expansive, but to the extent that there are examples, even with the language including but not limited to, I would like both of those examples to be listed specifically. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks. Nancy, please. On behalf of the family law section, we do support the recommendation of Professor Spitzer and his committee. Uh, we did also um, 
want to make sure that the gender affirming care and gender affirming advice be included. Um, on my own, the, I'm a little concerned about waiting till August to get another draft because the, the rulemaking process takes a long time as it is. And we're already dealing with women coming across the line from Idaho needing assistance, as well as women coming from all parts of the country because we're willing to do what needs to be done. So I would urge us to pass something today, even if down the road it gets uh, amended. I just wanted to add, I'm sure the committee is aware of this, but ultimately we could request that the court consider the rule change for expedited consideration, which would be a shorter process. Thank you, Tara. Okay, I see the hand up by uh, Pam, please. Um, yes, um, thank you um, for these very thoughtful comments. Um, many of them echo conversations that our committee had. Um, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of explanation of why we're here today. Um, one, I think the committee recognizes, as the governors have also recognized, the potential urgency of these questions because of the actions of other state legislatures. But two, um, the, the committee um, wanted to honestly hear the Board of Governors' views on an amendment of this type and get it before the Board of Governors as soon as possible, which is why we're here today, to get a sense of whether um, we should proceed immediately, should go back for further um, evaluation of different options, or whether the Board of Governors was disinclined to make a recommendation at all to the Supreme Court. Um, and so the conversation today has been very helpful in that regard. Um, on behalf of our committee, I think it would behoove us and uh, expedite the process if we go away with some sense of, of clarity today. Um, and I think we're well on the way to that. So thank you. And, and if I could uh, also add uh, that uh, it is summer. If we came back to you in August, um, uh, that probably works out pretty well because the Supreme Court is not likely to take this up during the summer. Um, interestingly, I've heard from a couple of members of the court that are really interested in this topic and wanted to see what we were doing. And I said, well, we got to send something to the Board of Governors first and then it'll get to you, which they understood. Uh, but in terms of expedited activity from the court standpoint, I think we might be able to get that. Thank you. So I think at this point, the board either adopts what is what is pr proposed or or ask them, you know, for more. Or are you just say no to it? So your guys is called. I, I move that we give the uh, committee an opportunity to uh, spiff up the comments um, just the way everybody will like them for submission to the Supreme Court at the appropriate time. Um, Second. Can 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 we clarify what spiff uh, means? And, like, okay. Okay. And then the, the um a scope too is that was that okay there it is uh, that is correct. Thank you for the friendly amendment. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, so that's been moved and seconded. Any 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 debate about this or? Okay. Sure, Pam. Sorry about that. I'd, yeah, I'd just like to point out that the next um, full meeting of the CPE does not occur until the end of August, um, mm. and so. 
I, I think it probably is going to be difficult, if not impossible, to get this on the, um, the Board of Governors agenda in August. I think September is a more reasonable um, assumption. And so the problem with that is then our September meeting is really early, so they may not have their other stuff in time then. Um, Mr. President, and so I mean, if I, I think there might be agreement to have a, a re, an adoption of the proposed language with the revision to add a including but not limited to reproductive rights and gender affirming care. But I thought we heard from Professor Spitzer that they would want to go back. So I, I mean, again, I'm I have made my position clear that I would not support passing the proposed as submitted. But I also don't want to step on CPE and be redrafting if if you would prefer it go back. So I I mean, I'm open to suggestions, knowing that personally I would be voting no if we're just going to be voting on today's submission. So one thing to ask a CPE is that could you meet earlier than scheduled? We can certainly, we have done that in the past, and we can certainly try to do that. It's difficult in the summer, as I'm sure you all know, to um, to get a quorum together to do that. Um, and I want to point out that ultimately this will be the Board of Governors um, recommendation, and it would be possible if the Board of Governors goes forward, um, I think, and, and I see our staff is here and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but if the Board of Governors goes forward and um, adopts a, a proposal with the amendment that's been suggested, then members of the CPE could work as, with you as we do with the um, Chief Disciplinary Council as well to prepare the um, the proper format for submission to the Supreme Court and so uh, like for your next meeting. Hear from, uh, 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 okay, yeah. yeah, sorry, but I think it's important that this go back to the CPE. I, I'm just stressing out right now because I have such huge respect for Hugh Spitzer. It is just terrifying to me to be saying anything, but anyway. I think, you know, it's very important that the Chief Disciplinary Council, who's not here, have a chance to weigh in on any change to this proposal. You know, drafting a comment to the RPC by committee is stressful. And so to me, it, it is more prudent to send this back. I understand your timing issues. Sorry. Um, you know, but but you're working on a very important issue. And so I think, you know, to the extent it is possible to meet earlier. Um, that would be fantastic, but I, I definitely respect the um, the expertise of this committee, and I think it's important, at least I think it's important that it go back. And we can certainly try to accommodate that. Um, okay, I, I just hit a hand raised by, yeah, by Jean. Hi, thank you. Jean Marie Claver, Senior Professional Responsibility Council and Staff Liaison to the Committee on Professional Ethics. Um, I just wanted to pipe up and say that summer is always a somewhat difficult time to get quorum. And the decision that's made and the and the uh, as Professor Spitzer said, the scrubbing that's done by the committee, professional ethics pretty much has to be done by the entire committee. Uh, not by the subcommittee, and it would require a quorum. So uh, we, in deference to the Board of Governors, we certainly can move this as fast as we can, but we may end up having some quorum issues. We have done that in the past, even in non-emergency situations, um, particularly during the month of August, if we try to move the, the meeting prior to the end of August as it is. It's, it's a very small committee. It's only nine members, and a number of the committee members do travel over the summer. We can we'll try do our best. Okay, I, I see the hand raised by um, um, Serena, please. Um, I guess I would ask. I mean, is for procedurally, is it possible to approve this now, given the time sensitivity of this, which I uh, fully recognize, and then? you know, request that the CPE go back with a further amendment 
per our discussion, subject to you guys fully vetting it, reviewing it. Um, I know that that seems kind of onerous because we're doing it in a two-step process, but I really do think that we are, um, the timing is critical on this. And unfortunately, both issues were not raised and presented to us. And I think both are important. However, it doesn't mean that one should not be dealt with in the immediate as it has been presented to us. So I guess I'm wondering procedurally if it's possible or if the CP board would object to um, you know, us passing this now with a mandate to go back with the revisions that we've discussed in this meeting. Okay, so there's been one per seconded. Um, do you take that as a, a friendly amendment or? Yes. And okay, so the motion, a, a one has as, as the second as well. I'm actually not so I'm not clear. So we're asking to approve because I'm not going to vote yes for this proposed. So I'm suggesting that the approval of conditions upon today then getting approved of the condition that they go back and further revise in the interim. But I don't know timing. That was my question. Like timing is that not practice? Or I mean, yeah. So with that, do you accept no. the friendly motion? Oh, 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 okay, then it's not been. So we need to vote on the uh, original motion then. Can you comment yeah. before we vote, President? Um, sure, Francis. Yeah. I think we are setting up the rules for failure if we do that. Because rules making is such a serious thing that- we Turn on your mic. Oh. We, set, uh, we will be setting the rule for failure if we do that. Because the rulemaking process has to go through that process. Otherwise, it will be subject to, um, to adversarial um, attack on it that this rule do not really follow the process set by the Board of Governor itself because it's conditioned upon something that is not being uh, commented, discussed by the committee and all of that. I just don't... If we were to vote on that, I would vote no. I agree with Governor Williams Root. I think that we should process as set for us, uh, as set ahead of time to be followed. When you break or make the rule as you go along, you are going to impact the, uh, the litigation that is going to be part of. This is going to be subject to litigation. You know that. All right, thanks, Francis. So let's go ahead and uh, restate what the motion is and vote on it, please. And I, I took a little liberty to make it clear. So let me know if, if you disagree. I took out Spiffy. Um, move to give the Committee on Professional Ethics the opportunity to revise and extend the scope of the proposal consistent with today's discussion. Okay. Okay, let's vote then, please. Uh, Governor Ottawale. Uh, just a minor point. It may be helpful to the committee to know that our meeting in September is on the 8th of September. So. Okay. Governor Ottawale. Aye. Governor Angelville. Aye. Governor Boyd. Not present. Governor Couch. Not present. Governor Dresden. Governor Fay. Aye. Governor Kading. Governor Wynn. Aye. Governor Petrasic. Aye. Governor Pertzer, not present. Governor Rathbone. Aye. Not present. Governor Sayani. Governor Stevens. Aye. Governor Williams Ruth. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.